Now it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Sankar Navanithan. He's a physician and associate professor of medicine at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and is the director of clinical research section in nephrology. And he's going to talk to us about KDGO diabetes guidelines and implications for the practicing nephrologist. Dr. Navinithan, thank you. Thank you. All right. I thank you. The uh, uh, thank you, the organizing committee, for the opportunity. Uh, it's just a coincidence. Last year, when this conference held at New Orleans, uh, this work group, the KDGO Diabetes Guideline Work Group, met in a different hall. And as you all may know, some of you may know that the uh, public review, the public review of this guideline just ended last week. And in fact, this is the first conference where this guideline is going to be presented. So. Um, so this would be changed, you know, of course, uh, we will be taking into account the comments that came from the public and if it, it would be addressed, but at least this is the public forum where it should be presented. So here are my disclosures. So why do we need a guideline specifically? As you all know, the, in 2012, KDGO issued a specific CKD guideline. But why do we need a specific diabetes and CKD guideline? And this is not diabetic kidney disease. So this guideline is titled KDGO Guidelines for Diabetes and CKD. Not all CKD in diabetes is related to diabetes. So if you look at the diabetic kidney disease over time in the US, uh, this is enhanced data. Two different publications from Ian DeBoer's group um, up in Seattle. Uh, the prevalence of DKD has, is about 2 to 3%. Not a drastic change, but if you look at the absolute numbers, it's about 8.2 million adults. So there's a lot of people with different forms of diabetic kidney disease, which includes people might have only albuminuria, they might have impaired GFR alone, or they may have the combination of both. So what about we, I mean, the people who take care of dialysis all know that 50% of our dialysis population have diabetes, and ESRD is the reason why they have uh, the di diabetes is the reason why they have ESRD. But if you look at the CKD, so how much diabetes itself is contributing? So this is, again, uh, the group from Seattle um, using the enhanced data. What it is shown here, among the diabetics that were included in the enhanced survey between 2009 and 2014, 25% uh, of them had CKD. On the other hand, non-diabetes accounted for only 5% of the CKD. So, in essence, one in four patients with CKD, you could attribute that it comes from the diabetes. So it's a big patient burden. And you may all recall the, the slide that Dr. Glenn Scherter showed this morning that unfortunately we are the specialty with least number of clinical trials. But thankfully in the past five years, there have been a rise in the, num you know, the clinical trials that are addressing different components of kidney disease. So the KDGO group had a, a controversies conference uh, five years ago wherein they assess the need for this diabetes guidelines, basically that led to this. So this is the work group. Um, the interesting part of the work group is I was part of this uh, committee uh, where we had 15 people, an equal number of endocrinologists and nephrologists were part of it. We also had primary care physicians, cardiologists, and notably two uh, patient representatives as part of it. And they were involved in each and every you know, recommendation that was made. Uh, before I move into the guideline, I just want to, uh, this was an eye-opener for me, this was my first experience, but uh, we paid not much attention into we recommend and we suggest, and what the guidelines say when they say we recommend is it's applicable to most patients. Uh, the guideline expect that most clinicians would follow and it would be adopted by policymakers across the board. When it is we suggest, it's a loose word, and you know it's up to the people uh, to adapt. And for many patients and many clinicians, it might not be applicable. They may not be using it. The second component of the uh, guidelines that usually comes out is what is the strength of evidence? A, B, C, D. Usually C and D is what we are extrapolating from non-CKD population. We know that we do not have clinical trials testing each and everything that I will show you uh, in the CKD population. So we are left with not much options but to go back to the general population and extrapolate those evidence. So a lot of places you would see that it is C and D, 
the true effect in those scenarios may be substantially differentiated, will be different from what it might be if you do the clinical trial. So there's a warning there. In these uh, guidelines recently, KDGO has adopted another important thing called practice points. So these are not official recommendations. What these practice points are consensus statements, basically from this work group, uh, focusing on a specific aspect of care and for which there is some evidence, but unfortunately the evidence is not strong enough to make a strong or weaker recommendation. So essentially this is expert judgment uh, from this work group, uh, so you may take it you know, uh, as you feel it, it's fit for your clinical practice. So the first one is the hemoglobin A1C measurement and target. So the first component is the measurement, you know, like do, should we measure hemoglobin A1C in, in people with diabetes and CKD? The answer is yes, and as you see, the grading here is 1C. Why is it? Because we know that the hemoglobin A1C uh, tend to be low if patients have anemia, transfusions that's falsely low, or the hemoglobin A1C could be high in the setting of carbamylation or metabolic acidosis. So can we rely hemoglobin A1C? But we, unfortunately, we do not have still other options available. We do have continuous blood glucose monitoring tools that have become available, but they have not been tested in CKD population. So taking all those things into consideration, the work group did feel that we still have to use hemoglobin A1C um, in people with diabetes and CKD. So there are some caveats which I'll point out in the next few slides. So what is the target? So this is something controversial. Uh, if you look at the ADA Standards of Care 2019, they recommend a hemoglobin A1C target less than seven. If you look at ACP guidelines, it's much more controversial. It's recommending seven to eight. Um, so this is what our work group came up with, 6.5 to eight. And why is this broad range? I'll show you this, uh, those, those studies in the next two slides. But it's a broad range because if you have to your left-hand side 6.5, you may want to target in certain sub uh, segment, for example, if they have earlier stages of CKD, if they have a longer life expectancy, i.e. they are young, if they know that they can take care of hypoglycemia when they feel that they are hypoglycemic, you may want to be aggressive with them. On the other hand, if they are um, older and if they can't take care of the hypoglycemic episode quickly, if they are an advanced CKD, you may want to liberalize the hemoglobin A1C. So this is the reason why such a broad uh, number has been chosen. Here is uh, a study, basically this is a individual patient data meta-analysis from the four largest studies that have tested whether intensive versus less intensive glycemic control is beneficial. These are ACCORD, ADVANCE, UKPDS, and the VA trial. So about 27,000 patients. If you look at the endpoint of end-stage kidney disease, renal death, or development of EGFR less than 30, so composite of diabetic nephropathy are all kidney outcomes that are relevant to clinical practice, you see that the more intensive glycemic control, you have a 20% lower risk for all these kidney events combined together. But if you look at the ACCA trial data alone, there were 6,500 patients who did not have CKD to start with. There were 3,600 very mild CKD. These are stage three CKD patients included in the ACCOT trial. For those who don't know the, uh, or haven't heard about the ACCOT trial is it compared an intensive glycemic control of about six versus a lenient glycemic control of over seven. So in that trial, in the CKD group, compared with the standard therapy, the intensive glycemic control was associated with a 31% higher risk of all cause mortality. So you control the glucose, you know, diligently and you get it lower, you get better kidney outcomes, but they die more. So where do you draw the line? So there are some practice points, uh, and, and, and I just selected a few here. So what we have included in the guideline is we cannot address every clinical scenario that you might face, but there are some common things that you all might face. So we have thought through that, and these are some of the ones here. How often do you measure hemoglobin A1C? So the recommendation here is you could at the least do two, and any time you change the medication, it's, it's common knowledge that you change the medication, you can uh, uh, measure hemoglobin A1C. And it's important to note that if your patient says that I'm getting more and more hypoglycemic, but if your hemoglobin A1C is artificially high, don't be aggressive because 
you know, the accuracy and precision of the hemoglobin A1C goes down as the patient's kidney function deteriorates. Uh, the next guideline focuses on the use of RAS inhibitor in this population. You might ask that why do we need a separate um, guideline to say that we need to use RAS inhibitor. Keep in mind all the other new drugs that I will show you later, in those clinical trials, 80% of them are on, or at least those clinical trials, they were on ACE and ARBs. On the other hand, in practice, if you look at, it's much lower. So the recommendation now, at least uh, this one, is we recommend the treatment with ACE and ARB be initiated in patients with diabetes, hypertension, and albuminuria, and titrated to the highest approved dose that is well tolerated. And why this is one of the studies that just came out in Jason that highlights that we still are not using ACE and ARB as they are supposed to be used. So this is, again, enhanced data. Just focus the orange color where you see that the ACE and ARB use based on the different time period. The most recent one, 2011 to 2014, among people with ACR over 30 milligram per gram, where you, uh, and they all have diabetes, so you would expect that they would be on ACE and ARB, but the use was about 40 to 50% at the best. We and others have also shown that at VA and at a different place, in general, the use of these agents is, uh, at the best is about 60%. Um, we expect that the KDGO guideline will be reaching out to also the primary care physicians because we know the stage three population with diabetes and uh, CKD and diabetes are not in our hands. Most of them are in the primary care hands. So this is a suggested approach to see how they could manage. Uh, my wife is an internist and every time the creatinine goes up, the ASRB goes away. And I don't want that to happen. And we have this conversation all the time. So this is a, a guideline, or this is a flow chart that has been developed to help primary care physicians. And most nephrologists in this audience would, would see that you would tolerate a 30% rise in serum creatinine with ASRB use. Um, if there is hyperkalemia now, not only diuretics, now we have newer agents that are available. So if you can justify that they can be on ACE and ARB with the use of these new agents, why not use them? And this is the most important uh, part of the guideline, which oral hypoglycemic agent that we are going to use. So the first one is in patients with type 2 diabetes, CKD, and EGFR over 30. We recommend that metformin be used as the first line of therapy. And this is 1B. The second statement is in patients with type 2 diabetes, the same patients, we recommend including an SGL2 inhibitor in the anti hyperglycemic treatment regimen. Now you see it's 1A because we have all the trials that I'll show you that clearly documented that there is patient-centered outcomes, there is improvement in mortality, kidney disease progression, all those have been demonstrated. So in patients with type 2 diabetes, and what if, if they can tolerate, if their GFR is 25, are we left with no options? Uh, thankfully, we do have some studies on GLP-1 receptor agonists. So uh, the guideline recommend that even though it's a slightly weaker 1B, but still in that population, you have the option of treating them with GLP-1 receptor agonists. What about metformin? We do not have any clinical trials uh, testing whether use of metformin improve uh, cardiovascular and kidney outcomes in this population. This is the best uh, study, probably a comparative effectiveness study, uh, selecting people among people with diabetes and reduced kidney function, people who are on metformin, and they selected a control group, people who were on sulfonylureas, and in different subgroups, all in all, in this uh, observational data, I have to highlight that, there was a 20% reduction in cardiovascular events with the use of metformin. Again, this is real life data. This is the best evidence that you know, we could come up with. And there are, again, uh, ADA and other guidelines. Everyone recommend right now metformin is the first line to manage people with diabetes. And we are in line with that, those guidelines. What about SGL2 inhibitors? So this um, uh, slide uh, is from Lancet paper, which was published earlier in the year. There is an updated meta-analysis I will show you. The field is growing so rapidly, at least when it comes to SGL2 inhibitors, the talk might not be rele relevant three months from now. So here you see that the kidney outcomes with SGL2 inhibitors based on the baseline EGFR. 
Uh, the three major trials um, are EMPA-REG, which tested empagliflozin versus placebo, CANVAS program that compared canagliflozin versus placebo, and the DECLARE TME that compared DAPA versus placebo in the setting of, again, ASRBUs and metformin people were on their uh, you know, pre-existing anti-hyperglycemic regimen. Convincingly, across the board, you see that there was a 30 to 40% reduction in kidney outcomes with the use of these agents. This is before the Credence trial. What about the cardiovascular outcomes? Again, pretty much similar, even though some of these, again, we are dissecting these numbers, you start to lose power. But most of them are to your left, showing that the, uh, it favors the cardiovascular outcomes were better with SGL2 inhibitors, irrespective of what the EGF, EGFR was. So the credence was presented um, in um, World Congress of Nephrology in April. Uh, this is a trial, the largest trial uh, that tested canagliflozin in 100 milligrams versus placebo, among those with EGFR 30 to 90 and also had proteinuria. Uh, the important part is it's about 4,400 4, patients. Uh, a good one third of them had an EGFR between 30 to 45, where there is no controversy whether they have CKD or not. Um, what you see there is the renal-specific composite, the dialysis transplantation, the panel B and D. You see that the canagliflozin, um, the, uh, there was a 30 to 40% reduction in both of those outcome measures that are being shown there. Uh, you dissect that again by baseline kidney function, whether they had proteinuria or not, you see consistent benefits. So the benefits have been documented all across the board. If you go and add now credence to the three studies that I showed you earlier, you see that the pool data now, there was a 33%, this is the, another meta-analysis published in Lancet a couple months ago, you see that there was a 33% reduction in the risk of dialysis transplantation and death. There are concerns, of course, these are not, these are newer agents, and nephrologists, of course, we do not have experience with these, we are borrowing this from endocrinology. Um, and is there concern for AKI? You look at CANVAS and you look at EMPAREG, uh, with the onset of, or with the starting of uh, SGL2 inhibitors, there is a decline in EGFR, and it is hemodynamic mediated. But would that persist? Are there some folks at risk for AKI? And this is two studies here um, that have test, uh, examined whether there was an increased risk of AKI with SGL2 inhibitors. Uh, the first one here, Mount Sinai and Geisinger, this is again real life data, cohort studies, uh, over 1,500 SGL2 inhibitors, users versus 1,500 non-users, median follow-up was about 14 months. You see that there was no increased risk of AKI. A similar study from Israel also confirmed that, uh, but there are of course other adverse events. Again, we are early in the game. There is increased risk of urinary tract infections, um, at least in the CANVAS program, there was, uh, with the canagliflozin, there was increased risk of fractures and lower limb amputations, which was, this is an FDA warning still out there, but this was not seen in the Credence trial that was just published. Uh, there is an increased risk of euglycemic DKA and Fourniers gangrene with these agents. So all these things have been taken into consideration, and if you read the practice points that I have selected only four or five. In fact, eight to 10 practice points there are in the guidelines which are um, useful for practice. So for example, you want to hold the SGL2 inhibitors when the patients are going to go for prolonged fasting or critical medical illness if they are in ICU. Uh, you want to maybe consider reducing thiazid or loop diuretics if you are starting these agents and you're concerned that their baseline blood pressure might be running low. Um, the question again comes, um, should we consider SGL2 inhibitor if they were started when their GFR was 40, 40 or 45, if they go below 30, should you stop it? Because metformin has to be stopped. Um, if you look at the, on, the trials so far that's been published, most trials have let investigators continue the SGL2 inhibitors even the EGFR hits 30. So at least the work group thought that it is reasonable to continue. There are two trials or at least one major trial that is has a inclusion criteria where the EGFR goes down to 25. So we might have some answers in 2020 ASN or beyond um, to see how low can we continue the SGL2 inhibitor. Uh, this is probably the best figure in the guideline. It shows you like the lifestyle therapy, still physical activity, nutrition, 
weight loss is the foundation. You want to build on everything on top of that. And then you have the option, again, if they are on metformin, continue as long as their EGFR is over 30. You want to definitely discontinue if it's less than 30. Um, SGL2 inhibitors, definitely you can start if they are more than 30. If they are less than 30, you do not need to discontinue, but do not initiate with based on the data that we have at this point. And for some reason, you can't use these agents, then you have the alternate agents that are being shown here. I'm gonna skip this here. Um, we have also provided the doses that have been tested in these trials so far. DAPA is five to 10 milligram once daily, and again, the dosing uh, recommendation based on the EGFR is to your right. EMPA, CANA, all those things have been presented uh, out there. This is a slide I also wanna spend some time is special considerations. Uh, as I mentioned, we cannot come up with recommendation for each and every clinical scenario. So what the work group considered was, if you have someone with fluid overload, uh, what would be some more suitable medications and what are some of the less suitable medications? And you see that the green color there uh, at about 11 o'clock position in that uh, figure, you see GLP-1 agonist might be the better options. On the other hand, if you have somebody would like to lose weight, what are the best option? And if somebody wants to do oral medications, what is the best option for them? So this slide kind of captures the different medications that are out there. And I do understand that as nephrologists, we do not initiate and we do not uh, use all these medications routinely, but at least this is a go-to place for you if you have to review. Um, lifestyle modifications, again, we are, uh, are sticking to the maintain the protein intake of about 0.8 gram per kilogram. Where does the evidence come from? Unfortunately, it's a 2C recommendation. There is no data to support that, but there is a KDOKI guideline that was also out for public review focusing on nutrition and CKD, which is expected to be released sometime in the next couple of months, and this is also in alignment with it. So the guidelines are concordant when it comes to protein intake. Uh, we do not need to lower it to 0.6 uh, or anything lower than that. What about sodium intake? Uh, 1.5 gram, it's uh, consistent across all the KDGO guidelines. Um, if you have patients assess if they are using uh, tobacco products, now you have newer uh, vaping and other things, so certainly physicians are encouraged to uh, explore the use of these products among your patients, and if so, then quit using those products. Uh, this is something new, that uh, physical activity guideline. In the general population, the physical activity guideline, at least the AHA, primary prevention guideline that came out in 2019 recommend that uh, moderate intensity physical activity for at least 150 minutes per week. That's about 30 minutes for five days a week. Uh, we added a caveat there because not all our patients might not be able to do or you might not be comfortable in recommending them because of their underlying cardiovascular or physical tolerance. So there is a statement, or at least, uh, you know, you want to assess that before you recommend this. The diet is an important part, and KDGO being an international guideline, we all now deal with, or we take care of patients from different ethnicity, from different countries, and this guideline will be adopted by many different people in many different countries. Um, as you see, people eat in plates, to rice balls, to injera, to tortilla, to banana leaves. So we have made some recommendations based on like how this could be adapted. Uh, I can uh, I share all those details in the talk, but certainly the guideline will address that. And again, the physical activity. And, I, and Dr. Um, uh, Willen this morning uh, talked about exercise. Uh, it cannot just be lip service. There may be some of your patients who might be already engaging in physical activity. If they may be doing 150 minutes, if they have a GFR of 60 or 40 to 45 to 60, they are active and they're doing their thing. Do you want to stop there? Is that, uh, so we are recommending again here, if they're meeting that goal, go and maybe encourage muscle strengthening activities. So it's not just walking on a treadmill or doing your bike, so you can think beyond that. Sarcopenia is a major issue with CKD population, so we can preempt that. Uh, another notable thing in addition here is self-management and team-based approach. We as dialysis uh, care providers, we do that. But when it comes to diabetes, we see patients and we just take care of the CKD aspect. So one of the uh, focus of this guideline is we want to 
uh, encourage people to think about st structured self-management education program that the patients themselves will be motivated. There will be a separate table in the um, uh, guideline which talks about what are some of the examples of these self-management educational programs that you could encourage or you could actually adapt to your clinical practice if you are interested. Um, so this is a flow chart showing how these all, this is quite difficult, we're seeing patients uh, in a 15 minute slot, 30 minute slot, where do you have the time? But these are some of the uh, uh, focus here, how you can bring in your nutritionist, how you can bring in an exercise physiologist, how can you educate your patient within the limited time that you have. And this ultimately pays off. And here is a, an example, um, combating diabetic kidney disease in Indian Health Service. And this is a, a documented benefit as we all know that American Indians and Alaskan natives have the highest rate of ESRD in this country. So what uh, Dr. Narva and colleagues did was, so the, what you see there, the black uh, line, it goes from 1996 to 2003, you see that the number of people among Alaskan, native, Alaskan Indians and American uh, Native Indians, you see that the ESRD rates have gone down. On the other hand, this is national data, on the other hand, you look at whites, blacks, Asians, and Hispanics, the rates haven't really changed at all. So what was done in the Indian Health Service, there were several things um, that were implemented in the past 20 years. One of the main thing is a team-based approach. In the team-based approach, one other important thing that they have focused on is optimizing the RAS use. As I mentioned, the RAS use across the board is about 60% in clinical practice. They have upped it up to 80% in this, and they have developed, you know, they have integrated dietitians into their visits. They have integrated physical exercise programs into their clinical pro programs, and these all clearly led to it. So that justifies why we need a self uh, you know, self-structured management program with a team-based approach. So uh, to conclude, uh, you will see this guideline, the final version of the guideline uh, will come out sometime in mid-2020. Uh, we have addressed most of the issues that are very relevant to physicians. Uh, we came up with questions to start with, and we tried to address through an evidence-based review process uh, everything that you would expect a guideline committee to do. The three things that are focused is hemoglobin A1C, different medication use, and lifestyle modifications. And the practice points we hope would be of interest to you. And again, this is, this is expert opinion or uh, consensus statements, if you may call. Uh, the guidelines, the other important thing is the, in the diabetes, as you all may be part of many of these clinical trials that are ongoing, we still have, in, there are fewer trials in GLP-1 agonists, there are trials that are testing novel mineralocorticoid receptor agonists. So we're expecting all those trials to be published in the next couple of years. As they will come on board, these guidelines will be updated. Um, so I'll leave it there. And I want to acknowledge the KDGO team and the, my, all my um, work group members. And you will see more presentations at ASN and other meetings this year. Thank you.